everybody. I'm Roshan Potkar, an author poet based in Bombay, and I have three poetry books to my name and one short story collection called Bombay Hangover. And today I will be taking you through a simple conversation on poetry. We were thinking about a workshop, but a workshop is an interactive medium and it requires me to look at what writings you've done and critique some of your works. So since that's not possible, what is possible here is a conversation. So we'll have a loose conversation. And as I always mention this, the conversations with poetry always start. They never end. So even in this, these 45 minutes to one hour, it would be a conversation. We would be talking on some of the themes of poetry, the spectrum of poetry, the epiphanies in poetry. And we'll, we'll, we'll keep it loose enough because I wish this was uh, you know, an in-person class where I could be talking to you or at least a Zoom session. But since this is a, this is a recording, uh, I'm just going to be uh, guiding you through a, a, a little journey and a conversation. So first and foremost, I'll tell you a little bit about what I think poetry is. I'm sure that to each of you here listening in, your relationship with the word, with poetry, will be very different. My relationship with poetry and words is something where I think poetry is more telegraphic, very telegram-like. You know, I think it's the Morse code of the universe. It tells you of prophecies. It's very psychedelic. It's very mosaic. And it's very philosophical, very lyrical at the same time. It's also in one breath. You know, you can outline a short story, you can outline a novel, you can outline uh, screenplays, but you can't outline a poem. You are attacked by a poem. It's like a bolt of lightning, or it's like you're going through a scented jungle or the woods picking up scents and are in a very raw state, an animal attacks you. That's like an epiphany, like an idea attacking you. It's very raw. So when you write poem, when you deliver a poem on a page, it's done in one exhalation. You may decide to chisel it in draft twos, but it's in one exhalation. There is no outlining here. That's the beauty of poetry, that it is all so close to the subconscious way of exhalation. Uh, when I look at poetry, you know, when I read a lot of poetry and when I write poetry, subconsciously, there's always an examination of what is the intersections of themes that are there? What is the interplay? Most of the times you yourself are not aware. None of the poets can tell you that, OK, they are going to be writing on five, six themes. No, we just write. And after that, we look at our footprints. Yeah, you look behind and at the footprint your poem has made. And mostly, it has to do with a thematic interlane, but it also has to do with many other things. Like, for example, epiphany. You know, epiphany is a concept that came from haibun, or the Japanese prose poetry forms of writing. They always spoke about haibun, that is the prose poetry form, being a narrative of an epiphany. Now, what is an epiphany? We get so many epiphanies in a day. We have nearly 65,000 to 70 thousand thoughts in a day. What are epiphanies? I think they are two or three realizations. You may have very strong realizations over the existences of your life, over your relationships, over your self discovery. You may have them in the night. You may have them early in the morning. It doesn't matter. Some of those realizations can actually be woven into poetry, into a high one. But I think epiphanies, I can also trace them in Pre verse poetry. Yeah, I can trace them in a haiku. So, what is an epiphany? So, we'll be tracing some epiphanies in the poems that we look at today. Besides that, I think about rhythm. See, many a times, you know, questions are asked as to uh, does a poem have to rhyme? So, I think rhyming is for nursery rhyming when uh, little, little children need to understand and read and remember things quickly. So, you have nursery rhymes. That doesn't mean you can't rhyme poetry at all as adults. I think you can, but you have to do it very beautifully then. It shouldn't be a forced thought 
that you wrote time so now you force it to rhyme with line yeah and then time yeah and then chime it should not be a forced rhyming but it has to be an organic rhythm so that's why we focus more on rhythm so poetry is about rhythm now rhythm is different for everybody we all have music inside us not only do we come from the land of music our own country but i think the world has so much of music in it we are very musical whether we know it or not so one of the things of writing poetry is to evoke the lyricism and music and musician that is there in you so rhythm is an important part of sound and word so when you write poetry there is a rhythm in which you write they say the rhythm is connected with breath and that is not uh, very very unconnected actually a thought so to speak because uh, the way we breathe is the way we write our sentences and lines so if you have been a writer for long you will notice this or start noticing that the way you inhale and exhale if you are always in a rush you can write more staccato crisp faster closer to writing a haiku and if you are into the deep living into the layers of existence your exhalations will also be long your sentences will be long you might be writing so called long winding sentences but don't bother with those definitions you just understand the way words play in and out with your breath yeah and that makes you a prose writer or a lyrical writer or a prose poet yeah write rather than writing lean so there are many ways in which you can look at how you form phrases and how long are the length of those lines uh so rhythm is one thing resonance is another thing now resonance is something which i feel is so universal that it's not just for poetry but you would want to know about resonance in everything right do you resonate with your relationships in your relationships do you resonate as a parent with your child with uh, you, a lover with your lover uh, in the world under the sun over this under the sky over this earth do you resonate are you relevant no it doesn't mean that all poetry needs to be relevant some poems are just curations of the moment in time you may write something and it to another person they might listen to it and not remember it you yourself may not remember it not every poem needs to be remembered but every poem can be written every poem needs to be written because it's a curation of life curation of a moment now you can decide as a poet what you need to show to the world or not you may not want to show every curated poem every curated moment to the world you may want to show uh, you know the curation of a time period yeah but resonance is something i thought a lot about because i've read a lot of poetry seen a lot of films read a lot of books not all can i remember not everything do we remember so what is resonance so resonance is something that i leave it up to you i don't have a definition but i think the deeper you live the more authentic you express your resonance will come through to the people who probably either understand the same experiences you are going through or they are seeking the same truths that you have found so resonance is not something that i can define but it is definitely something to be to think about for the world in general not just for uh, poetry but for every art form and then i think of residue residue is very important because we don't remember everything so what are the things we remember and why do we remember them did you live that deeply to write that deeply so that the reader lives that that deeply when i think of the big crunch and the big bang you know these are scientific terms but when i think of the haiku it is so small it's just two images in three lines and those images need need to juxtapose to give a deeper meaning most of the time then i think of how small a haiku is and how it's the big crunch yeah of meaning because the more you hover around a haiku it's like hovering over a rose the more you live with the rose the more you will understand the rose and then it opens itself up whereas i think a screenplay a novel is the big bang it expands and expands into the universe of the reader long after a book is closed the reader is still thinking about those characters the viewer is still thinking about those characters so it's a big bang it expands the universe 
of the story world into the minds of the reader long after the book is shut, the film is done. So big bang, big crunch. Now coming back, okay, uh, what I think we would be doing now is uh, looking at certain uh, poems, okay, and because this, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, a conversation, I've taken my own poems so I can talk more about it, even from the viewpoint of the poet behind the poems and the epiphanies from where they came or the structure. So we'll be looking at epiphanies, we'll look at structure, we may look at rhythm, we may find new things along the way, we'll stumble along new things. And what I want to advise you in case uh, you have, you're running short of time and you would only see the first part of this uh, conversation, please do not stop reading poetry. If you're not already reading, please start by reading international poetry that, uh, you know, uh, comes over Poetry Foundation and all those international poetry magazines which are very well curated and edited. The reason being is because English is an international language and even Indian English is an international language, you must know uh, what the world when it expressed in English poetry thought and wrote. So even love, what does love mean to, to uh, you know, an Irish poet? What does love mean to a Sri Lankan poet? What does love mean to uh, a Malayalam poet translated into English if you're not reading Malayalam? But uh, reading international poetry will give you an understanding of where do you start? What's your voice like? It actually makes you discover your own voice. So I suggest you read a lot of poetry if you want to write a lot of poetry. Whatever you want to do, you should ingest a lot of it so that there is an incubation of it. And then your writing really has something very beautiful and unique, which is very close to your voice. It doesn't become generic. Otherwise, if we, you don't read, what you write is something very jaded and cliched, repetitive and tired, because we are only one drop in this ocean. So we need to connect with the other drops to know how did they rain. Yeah. So I suggest a lot of reading. And I feel that reading a poem a day keeps the writer's block away. So if you are a professional writer, even if you are not, it really is the metaphysical apple. OK. So uh, I'll take you through uh, you know, poems. And I must say that uh, my third book of poetry is coming out uh, uh, later, maybe next year or early next year. Uh, and I don't write uh, poems in a way that I curate moments. Usually my poems are closer to being thesis. So if I write on uh, one kind of a theme, then I don't try to repeat a lot of it because my mind moves to another theme and that becomes a thesis. But I don't have, uh, you know, I enjoy reading poetry. That's just curations of little, little moments. Every poet has their own ink and their own thought. So uh, we'll now go jump into some of the poetry, uh, the poems that I have chosen for you. I'll share the screen. And again, we'll just do an informal conversation. I wish you were here in person so that we could have had a nice discussion. I could have seen some of your own writings and uh, you know, critique some of them. I do conduct workshops at the Himalayan Writing Retreat where we can have more interactions. But here, it will just be me talking. So please bear with me. So I'll share screen and uh, we'll go to we'll go to uh, the first poem. And if you and me can read this slowly, that will be even better because uh, that way, even my own noise as a poet won't come to disturb the poem. Yeah, so we will read it silently over the page together and conjure the poem. The poem is called Timely.
All right. Yeah, so this poem, Timely, and uh, yeah. So this poem is from my book, Four Degrees of Separation. It's one of my first poems that I've written, and it's also the first poem that somehow finds its place in this collection. So uh, I think it's a philosophical poem. If you were around, I would have asked you, what do you think about it? But since you're not around, you think about it. And maybe you can email me what you think. I am at rochellepotkar at gmail.com. It's very simple, R-O-C-H-E-L-L-E-P-O-T-K-A-R at gmail.com. But this poem is a philosophical poem, according to me, because I'm not talking about one life. I'm talking about many lives and uh, many lifetimes. And if you ask me about the structure of this poem, I think it has a free verse structure. OK, it's a very small poem, one of my small poems. I write very, very large poems, which I'll show you. But this is a smaller poem. And uh, this poem has imagery of flowers and petals and perishability. Here, the most important theme is perishability. But the perishability is not to do with the flowers. It's to do with us. And it's to do with life. It's to do with the temporality. And at the end, I say, there is no time in its petals. Only the saga of one sunrise and one sundown. And how many times I have felt like a flower myself through the totem pole of the day. In the beginning, I'm all fresh and my biorhythms are all great. And I'm writing a lot of stuff and thinking and doing a lot. It's almost the Pareto's principle at work. 80% of the work is getting done in 20% of the day. And as the day moves to its noon and evening and by night, I'm like a wilting flower. I need a break. I need a... Uh, recharge. So it is following the pattern of many a people, only not the night people, the day people who wake up in the day and they, you know, by the time it's night, you want a slower life. It also follows somewhere the sattvic, rajsik, tamsik kind of uh, texture. Uh, the totem pole, I call it the totem pole of the day, but uh, this poem is beyond the totem pole of the day. It's also, you know, a life. How short is our life? And how much do we want to do in that tiny little day and tiny little life? If you ask me from where the, where did the epiphany for this poem came through, I think, um, uh, you know, there is a lot of restlessness in all of us. There's a restlessness in me also to do a lot of things. So I think somebody had once advised me, why are you so restless? Go slow, you know, go slow. So I started thinking about what it is to go slow or go fast. What is slowness and speed? based on another person for another person, right? What is speed? Is it only the relativity of velocity and time? Okay, or is it your own raftar of your blood? The blood gushing in your veins is your own raftar. So how you live your life is based on how much blood is gushing through your veins. If it's gushing very fast, you want to do a lot of things. If it's slower, again, it's the breath, remember? The breath is everything, the breathing and how deep we breathe, how deep we live. So I thought, no, this is my speed. This is my raftar. And then I thought into this large space of time, timeliness, temporality, and the perishability. OK, so somewhere I am in perfect rhythm with myself. It might be restlessness to others. It might be slow to others, Yeah, to the, to the more restless people. But this is my time. So time became from there. OK, I will. Uh, Stop sharing the screen so that I can actually navigate to another poem, which we will read quietly. I'm just typing that out. OK, this is the poem. It's called Biscuity Love, and it's in two pages. OK, and we will scroll through and read it. OK, and here I go again to share the screen. When my publisher had introduced this book to new readers, he had said that this poem is enough to synopsize your entire book. And I don't disagree with that. It has a good recall value in its niche uh, readership of in Indian English poetry. People do remember the Biscuity Love. It does well in schools and colleges if I ever go to do a workshop to break the ice. OK, so we'll read it again in silence.
And the next page. All right. If you miss this poem, you can always get this poem uh, on uh, online or you can just uh, get it from the book Four Degrees of Separation. So this poem again is about, uh, if you say the structure, it's three verse. But if you look at the themes, the themes are not just love, it's not just biscuit, but it is of a young girl's old memories of her first love. Now, we all have memories of her first love. But it's also the small town where I grew up. And this small town is also transmogrifying into a larger town, probably closer to being not a city, but a larger town. So it's the transmogrification of not just the place or the city, but also what has happened to that old love. You know, is that old love still there? No, he is not there. But where has he gone? He also morphed and shape shifted into this dynamic modern man of modern India. So I'm talking of many things simultaneously, but here the device is biscuit because it is, you know, the epiphany is that when you love somebody a lot, you feel like biting them, right? Or eating them up. And it's not, uh, it's not uh, like, I mean, it's a very innocent thing and you want to bite them, eat them, right? So I thought of biscuits. And this boy had a fascination of feeding dogs with a lot of biscuits. He was very earthy with, you know, like doing ghar ka kaam and, you know, there was this lot of earthiness in him with the parag milk packets and everything and biscuit. And so this thing came, biscuity love. And it's a very yummy, it's a very crunchy kind of a, 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 a curation of love, a small town turning into a going towards city. It's like a river going to sea. So there are so many things. In fact, that's why I said it's a psychedelic mosaic. Because many a times, uh, a poem that you write is not what you write, but it is something else. Okay, so I always feel you write a poem, then you write the subtext of the poem, or you write a shadow of the poem. You write an eclipse of the poem. You write a refraction of the poem. A poem is like a shaft of light. It refracts, and it refracts for you as a poet, it also refracts in the minds of the readers. So it's very difficult actually to catch the tail of a poem also. Sometimes I feel you can't really catch. It's like the fish in the ocean. You, know, you can touch its slippery uh, skin, but you really can't catch a poem. That's why it's so beautiful in its abstract capturing. Okay, uh, so I'll try to go to another poem. Uh, what is the one that I've selected? In the meantime, let me tell you that there are some, uh, there are different ways in which you can write and express poetry. Uh, once I had sent my poem to uh, an international site that was looking for uh, filmmakers to interpret the poem, and uh, they picked up Skirt, which is again my poem in Four Degrees of Separation. They made a two minute poetry film out of that. And eventually, Shonda Rhimes from Shonda Land, okay, uh, she uh, picked it up for uh, her blog. And Skirt as a poetry film features on Shonda Rhimes, Shonda Land blog. So you could, you could actually think of poetry films as an expressis and uh, a, a place where film, filmmaking and poetry can come together. Okay. Or it could be a visual poetry. Yeah. Wherein, um, you, uh, I'll, I'll show you some visual poetry that I've written uh, or I have made actually, which uh, sometimes uh, is a different way of how you capture poetry. Okay, so I'll move to uh, uh, yeah another poem which I'm just searching for you to share screen. And here we go. Here we go. So um, sharing screen once again with you. And uh, this poem is transmogrified and. Uh, here I am going to talk about the a different layer of love. You know, we all have the themes that we like, yeah. And uh, one and when the themes become very common, that you go to certain themes more than others, 
I think it's called the lead motive, thematic lead motive. And my lead motive, one of them has always been social relationships or rather uh, relationships in society, how they, uh, they interplay, romantic and sexual relationships also. I'm very, uh, I really love to, uh, love to study man and woman relationships and uh, um, see how they interplay not only in the four corners of themselves, but how do they interplay and execute themselves in society. So transmogrified has come from one shade of love. If you ask for the epiphany or we are tracing epiphanies, which is not that uh, lovey-dovey. It's a little violent. It's a little playboyish. It's a little lethal. It's heartbreaking, but I move beyond that to look at uh, to look at what does it mean. So we read the poem first silently as we are doing, and then we'll talk about it. One good uh, one good uh, honor of this poem was that uh, this poem was featured and published in Poetry Foundation Chicago, and I consider that to be the final frontier of, of where a poem can reach, at least in English. So. Uh, you know, I consider it with grace that it reached uh, uh, Poetry Foundation Chicago. I have heard that it takes 15 years of submission to get published in Poetry Foundation. I was quite fortunate to uh, be invited to submit uh, by editors uh, who were working on Asian American, uh, an anthology of uh, poetry. So Kasim Ali and uh, Raji Mohabi, Mohabi so son uh, were the editors and I'm so grateful to that. So this, let's read this poem. So I hope you've read it, yeah. All right, so this poem, uh, how did the epiphany come about is I was listening to a lot of love stories, like you know that our best friends or friends, uh, you know, once they sit comfortably with you, will share about their love lives and heartbreaks and all kinds of things. So I happened to be listening to both the girl who was my friend and the boy who was my friend, but without, realize, with, without each realizing that they are telling me their versions of the story. And they were talking about their heartbreaks. And their heartbreaks were pretty misaligned between what the boy said about the girl and what the girl said about the boy. But what came together for me was that a kind of a tale of relationships. I won't say that it's the modern day tale of uh, modern love or something, because I don't think uh, any one person's love story can symbolize a modern love. I think uh, we will never really understand love and love itself will refract every uh, every other day. Uh, for anyone to understand what love is. That's why we write so many stories and poems on love, because we don't understand love. If we had understood love, we wouldn't write anything. We wouldn't seek more love, right? We wouldn't. We write because we seek. But uh, this poem came through from, from that, and it became transmogrified. And, uh, uh, you know, later I also was kidding myself, thinking, you know, this is not just about uh, a boy who's, or, or, a, or a lover who's moving very fast through through lovers and you know the other lovers we left behind and it's also i was watching the city of bombay because i live in bombay and it, there was so much of uh, you know um, debris flying because flyovers were coming over this is much before the metro was getting developed and i was also looking at how the city is transmogrifying in uh, in its forward movement to development okay and bettering of your lifestyles uh, we move, we always move in forward directions. Now it is only at what speed you move. This is again taking me to the theme of time timely, right? But it's also something different. How fast does one person move in a relationship vis-a-vis -vis another person? And what happens then in a love relationship? Is there a heartbreak or is there reconciliation? Is there more communication? What if two partners don't 
uh, you know, go together in time. We, we want to go together in time, but sometimes one person is too fast and the other person too slow. So uh, this became transmogrification. And it, I saw this happening in the city as well uh, with its forward movement of development and metro and flyovers happening all over the city. So uh, now I would uh, uh, you know, take you to, through uh, High Bull, which, is, uh, which I do long uh, classes on, like seven hour classes, or I do it in uh, universities, uh, in classrooms as guest lectures. Uh, but since we are here, uh, I'll take you through the High Bull, which is a prose poetry form. And it was first written or uh, invented by Basho, the 17th century Zen Buddhist poet, who wrote his travelogues in prose poetry, lyrical prose poetry, and he interjected it with haiku. Haiku is a three-line poem, but it, it has two images that juxtapose between nature and human existence. And haibun is the prose of it. So we'll see one of it, yeah, and we will study again its themes, its, uh, its epiphanies, and uh, its imagery, so we will study a lot of it. And I chose Spice Garden for you because mm, it's near lunchtime and I am a bit hungry, I think. Or let me see, I'm I'm foodie and I love colors and I love flavors. So I chose Spice Garden for that. So uh, we'll just read it again silently. You know why I read silently? It's because I want you to conjure this on the page rather than the noise of the poet. Yeah. Okay, so Spice Garden, if you read it properly and you can pause and read it because this is an electronic session, you would see that uh, it has a lot of imagery and a very tropical imagery and it has got a lot of spice and delight and I think mouth-watering delight. And uh, you can even see the interplay of sun and shade. You can see the interplay of uh, different spices and different people who have, forget, who have forgotten their passports are eating. Now, one thing I want to tell you about Haibun is that uh, anything can be uh, wrapped around the narrative of an epiphany. You don't need to have a big event. Okay, This is not journalistic writing. Even something as beautiful as this amalgamation of people eating and forgetting everything else and they're hungry. You know, when you're hungry, food tastes much better because you're so hungry that the body will accept even simple dal rice as biryani. It's delicious. So uh, I just wanted to play on the taste, but not without all the spices. I think I'm celebrating the Indian spices, but I'm also celebrating the unity that food brings about in uh, with for different people of different races and, you know, uh, spice. And uh, I am interjecting them with uh, the baby's drool and a mother's lost cravings because, we, you, you know, right? I mean, a baby drools when they say that. It's just a saying that, the mother didn't get to have her favorite food during pregnancy. So I caught those two images together. And I also caught the image of turmeric and uh, the, you know, the, the lover's skin. Uh, just because it was very moist and 
the smell of spice sometimes is a smell of uh, i don't know a lover's skin because i think a lot of spice also oozes through your pores as you you, you consume that spice and uh, you know uh, it, it it does so cinnamon and all those kinds of things or maybe just perfume with spicy perfume uh, so this is a, a high bun i'll show you another high bun only just to introduce you to the form and it's a uh, i think a high bun is much uh, much uh, you know um, uh, it's more embracing because you can be a storyteller and a poet together when you're writing a high bun and uh, you can write on anything okay and you just like write it in lyrical uh, lines okay so that makes it even better okay so this one is still born and the theme is uh, domestic violence but uh, just read it And the next page. All right, so uh, this poem is actually a poem on domestic violence, and uh, uh, this poem. Uh, doesn't only talk about one protagonist or one little boy who couldn't rise at the right time to save his mother, but it talks of courage, not being there when you need it, and what if courage came much later. So that's why the title of Stillborn, because I was trying to think about what if your courage came much later, then the unwanted butterfly is somewhere where I, where I land the haiku, okay? So the haiku, and I must tell you this, uh, being the being the writer of this uh, haibun, and this is in Paper Asylum, my book of haibun, is that when I wrote the haibun, I did think a lot about domestic violence, and I also thought about domestic violence across the ages. This is not one boy protagonist I'm talking about. Actually, it's every child who is living helplessly in a house of domestic violence and can do nothing about it. So they have a lot of helpless rage which they can do nothing about at that time. And what happens if you have an unwanted butterfly after a breakup? So I wanted to, now breakup is not to do with this, with the marriage here of the prose. It's a different uh, uh, different scene. But in Japanese prose poetry, you can juxtapose any state of existence with anything. So the haiku can be completely different. It can be about a completely different gender. And the haibun can be tell, tell you a tale of a different person. And they can juxtapose together. So, uh, and they still make meanings because uh, the Japanese believe that uh, anything you can put together with anything, it will still juxtapose and give meaning because existence is all interconnected at, uh, uh, you know, in, in an underlying way. So, um, uh, this was like I written the prose and I was searching for the haiku, and for very long, I couldn't, I did, couldn't find a suitable haiku. And eventually, I did think. Uh, I was reading a newspaper article wherein um, uh, someone, you know, two people were dating and uh, they had bought a house for themselves and later they broke up and uh, the house had to be sold. And I thought about the house being an unwanted butterfly. Usually metamorphosis is con connected with, uh, you know, um, something very positive, like you want, everybody wants to metamorphose, yeah, to, to break out into wings. But what if the metamorphosis has no meaning? What if your courage comes too late? Yeah, so we are going back to the prose of missing the bus on courage, perhaps. So, so, so all these kinds of things. So, uh, this, uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is from my book, Four Degrees of, sorry, Paper Asylum. 
And I'm wondering if I will read, uh, I will end this uh, conversation. I wish this was a interactive conversation. I am sorry that it isn't. But uh, I will read one poem from my a new book, which is coming out in, um, which is coming out in uh, this year end or next year beginning. And uh, I'll read a poem. And uh, what I would like you to do and urge you to do is uh, read a lot of uh, poems from Poetry Foundation, rattle.com. A lot of free poetry is there, good curated poetry on free online journals. Uh, you can also buy anthologies uh, written by Indian English poets. Uh, um, you will get them. You will even find my books on, on Amazon and bookstores, uh, Paper Asylum, Four Degrees of Separation. And uh, read a lot and write a lot. You, your second stage has to be editing. If you want a, a more interactive course, I conduct courses at the Himalayan Writing Retreat every alternate month and if they are paid workshops and they are online and sometimes i go into the hills to teach uh, at the himalayan writing retreat but mostly if year round i have online workshops so you can actually uh, you know uh, enroll there and it would be more interactive and i could give you critique and i could listen to what you have to say on art i do believe that art the self and time follows a triangulate relationship we all evolve. Time evolves, art evolves, and you evolve. And that's why you will evolve in your art through time. I will leave you with this uh, um, you know, poem called Ant Hill. And this one I will read for you. No one could build or architect one. Ants are not easy listeners. They are migrants, militants. Why would they come to give us lessons in community building? strategy or order even if we don't have much even for the food they steal it's a unique gift no one gave no one the most they gifted was a virgin island but i want you to have an anthill one that can be placed under your tree poems where wise red rich ants organize their evolution egg laying queens workers, soldiers, new nests, nuptial fights. The Mercedes you can buy for yourself. Someone can always gift you a Harley Davidson. I saw anthills in Mataran on red clay trips made from childhood to a second childhood in adulthood. They stood proud, the test of rain, their citadel, a sun-burnished fortress of pride, of underground passages, no aggression super colonies. And if you went close, they attacked with pungent defense. How would we migrate an ant into your garden and house then? Will they listen to your poems, obey the winds, learn a new song? The real purpose of an ant home is so we can tame these organized creatures, tame unruly elements of nature. All that an anthill was made of, strategy, order, piles of earth, sand, pine, needles, clay, urine, and manure. OK, with this, I'm going to stop uh, the, the conversation. And I would like to thank uh, Pragati Ivichar uh, for inviting me to conduct this uh, conversation talk, which we first thought would be a workshop. but uh, but that requires interaction. But I would like to thank all of you who are listening in and uh, hope you do write a lot, read a lot of poetry and meet me someday at some festivals with your books. I would love to take a signed copy from you. And uh, with this, I sign off. Thank you very much.